Hey guys, my name is Tensor. Welcome back to the Golang Hexagonal Microservice Architecture Tutorial Series. This will be part two of the series. And in this video, we'll be building out the ports for our repositories and for our serializers. In the last video, we built out the app and domain logic, which is the inner hexagon. Now we want to start to build out the larger hexagon. And we'll do this by creating the port that will connect to our repository, which in our case will be both MongoDB and Redis. And then we'll create an adapter, which will allow us to serialize our data to and from JSON and to and from message pack. Essentially, we'll be building modules that use these interfaces so that we can connect our service to the appropriate resources. In the case of the serializer, we'll implement serializers for both message pack and for JSON. And then in the case of the repository, we'll implement this interface for both MongoDB and Redis. First, let's start with the serializers. So notice I've created some folders here. I've called one repository and it's got MongoDB and Redis inside of it. And then I've got another one here called serializer, which has JSON and message pack inside of it. Let's first start with our JSON serializer. And notice I want to import the logic from our shortener folder. So I'm going to import the name of the project, which is github.com tensor programming hex microservice. And then the name of the package, which is just short shortener. And I'm also going to import the JSON encoding library and then our GitHub package errors library, which is the one that allows us to wrap our errors inside of another error. Then down here, we'll define our redirect struct so that we can implement the redirect serializer interface on this struct and we'll define decode and encode. And both of these are pretty simple. So decode just takes in the input in a slice of bytes and it generates a redirect and then it uses JSON on Marshall on the input and puts it inside of the redirect. And if this fails, then we get back an error that it failed and we wanna tell that it failed inside of the decode function. If it doesn't fail, then we just pass back our redirect and then we pass back nil for our error. Then down in encode, we take in the input, which is just a redirect struct type. And then this will pass back a slice of bytes and an error inside of a tuple. And for this one, we just call JSON Marshall on the redirect. And this will give us back the raw bytes and an error if there is one. And if there is an error, then we'll take that error and wrap it again and tell the command line that it happened inside of the encode function. If there's not an error, then we'll just pass back our raw message slice of bytes, which is the Marshall JSON. Now we can go and create our message pack serializer. And you'll notice here that the code is basically the same as what we just created for our JSON serializer, except we've got maybe one line difference inside of each of the methods. We want to import the shortener and we'll import a library that will allow us to deal with the message pack format. We'll again create our redirect struct and then we want to implement the two methods on the redirect struct. With the code, we'll create a redirect again, and then we'll use message pack unmarshal on our input, and we'll put it inside of the redirect. And again, we'll pass back the redirect if it succeeds, and if it fails, we'll pass back an error that tells us that this serializer didn't work. Then with encode, we'll take in our redirect and we'll just call message pack Marshall instead of JSON Marshall on that input, and this will give us back a slice of bytes and an error which we can then handle down here like we did with our JSON. We're now finished with our serializer logic, so we can move on to our repository logic. Let's start with MongoDB. So we want to go ahead and make some imports here. I'm importing a bunch of Mongo libraries. I'm also importing the GitHub package errors library, the time library, and the context library. And of course, I'm importing our microservice business logic. Then down here, I'm creating a structure called Mongo repository. And this will have a client inside of it, which is just a Mongo client. And then it will have the database string, which will just be the name of the database inside of our MongoDB. And then it will have a timeout, which will be a time duration. And this will just be the time that it takes to timeout. For instance, if we call to the database and we don't get a message back within, say, 30 seconds, then we'll time it out. 
Now let's go ahead and create a function here, which will allow us to generate a new Mongo client. And this is just the client part of our repository, not the entire repository. We pass in our Mongo URL string and then the Mongo timeout, which is just an integer. And then we're just going to pass back a Mongo client and an error inside of a tuple. We'll go ahead and we'll generate a context with timeout and we can generate this by using a context background and then a time duration and our time duration will take in our Mongo timeout and then we'll multiply that by time.second. So if we pass in say 30, then it will be 30 seconds. We want to then call defer on cancel so that our context will properly time out. Then we can go ahead and create the actual client by calling mongo.connect, passing in the context, and then passing in an option struct with the client attached to it. And then we can call apply URI with our mongo URL on it to create the client. Then we want to handle an error. And then we want to just perform a simple read on our database to make sure that we have access to it. So we can use readpref.primary to do this. And you can see here it says primary constructs a read preference with a primary mode. So it basically just confirms that we can read our database. And if we get back an error here, we want to handle it. Otherwise, we want to return our client and nil. Now we can go ahead and create a function which will take in our Mongo URL, MongoDB, and then the Mongo timeout, and then pass back a redirect repository interface or an error inside of a tuple. So we're basically just going to take our Mongo repository struct and implement the interface on top of it with this function and then of course with the methods that we need for the repository. So we'll generate the repo and we just want to generate the timeout and then the database. So we're just passing in the database here. It's just the string and then the timeout is just time.duration with our Mongo timeout times time.second. Then we can call our new Mongo client function to generate the new client. And we just want to call this with our Mongo URL and our Mongo timeout. And if we get back an error, we want to wrap that error. And then we can go ahead and put the client inside of our repo struct before we pass the repo back from this function. And of course, you can see here that we're getting an error because this struct doesn't implement the interface just yet. If we go ahead and create the two methods on the Mongo repository though, that error will go away. So now we have our find and our store methods attached to our Mongo repository. So find takes in the code and then it will pass back a redirect or an error inside of a tuple. And then store takes in a redirect and then passes back an error if it fails. With find, we're just going to be searching through our database to get a redirect URL from the database if the code is correct. We want to create a context with timeout and we can do this by using our struct timeout and then the context background. Then of course with our timeout we want to defer the cancel so that it will properly timeout if it does. Then we can go ahead and create the redirect struct that we want to populate. And now we can go ahead and call to our database and we can get back a collection from our database. So we use r.client and then we can call database, pass in r.database, which is our database string. And then we can look for a collection called redirects and then that will give us back the entire collection here. Then we can go ahead and create a filter using bsun.m and in here we can just put in that we want the key code inside of our collection. We can then use this filter to query the collection by calling collection.find1 with our context and the filter inside of it. And then we want to decode it into our redirect struct. Now, if we get back an error and that error is Mongo error no documents, then we'll pass back an error. Otherwise, we take any other error and we just wrap that error. And then if we don't have an error calling our collection, we can just return the redirect and then nil. Our store method is a little bit simpler than our find method. So we just take in a redirect and then we pass back an error if it fails. So again, we create our context with timeout by using our context background and then the Mongo repository timeout value. 
and again we want to defer cancel. Then we can go ahead and get the collection. So we can call r.client.database, pass in our r.database, and then call dot collection redirects. And then with this collection, we can go ahead and call insert one, pass in our context, and then use bsun.m to create the structure for the document that we want to insert into this collection. And if we get back an error from doing this, then we'll go ahead and report that error by wrapping it. And if we do not get back an error, then we'll just return nil. Okay, so now we're finished with our Mongo repository logic. So let's go ahead and implement the Redis repository logic. And our Redis repository will be a bit simpler than our MongoDB repository. Because of the way that Redis works, we can go ahead and just put the Redis client inside of our Redis repository, and we don't need to add any additional fields. Then we can go ahead and create our new Redis client function. This just takes in the Redis URL string, and then it will pass back a tuple of the Redis client and an error. And we can just call redis.parse URL on the Redis URL, which will give us a option struct which we can then use to connect to our Redis server. If we get back an error, then we want to handle it. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and we'll create a new Redis client by calling redis.newclient on our options. And then we want to make sure that we can connect by calling client.ping.result. And if we get back an error from doing this, then we want to return it. Otherwise, we want to return the client and nil. Now, like how we did with MongoDB, we can go ahead and create another function here called new Redis repository. This time it only takes in the Redis URL string, but it still outputs a redirect repository interface type and an error inside of a tuple. So we go ahead and we create our Redis repository. Then we go ahead and we call to our new Redis client function with our Redis URL inside of it. This gives us back our client and if we get an error, we want to deal with that error. Otherwise, we'll take the client and we'll put it into our Redis repository struct and then pass that repository back. Now, Redis is just a key value store inside of memory. So we want to create a utility function called generate key, which will allow us to create the key that we're going to use to get the data from our database. We can go ahead and just create this as a method and it'll take in the code, which is just the string that we generate and pass back as our shortened URL. And we can then just use fmt.sprintf to append this onto redirect colon, and then we can use that as our key. All right, so now let's go ahead and implement our find method. Find just takes in the code string and then it passes back a redirect and an error inside of a tuple. And we can go ahead and generate that redirect. Then we can call to our generate key method with our code inside of it. And then we can go ahead and call to our Redis client and call hgetAll and pass in our key. So we get all of the values associated with this key, and then we want the result, so we call dot result on this. If we get back an error, then we want to handle it. And if the data has a length of zero, we also want to handle it. And for this, we can pass back shortener dot error redirect not found. Then we need to parse our created at timestamp because it's going to be stored inside of Redis as a string, but in our data structure, it's an integer. So we can use string convert parse int and then pass in data created at, which is the map that we got back from calling to Redis. And we want to parse this integer as a decimal, meaning it's of base 10 and as an int 64 bit. If we get back an error from doing this, then we want to handle that. Otherwise, we can take our data structures and put them into our redirect struct. So data code inside of our data map will go inside of our redirect code. Then data URL will go inside of redirect URL. And then created at will go inside of redirect created at. And then we can just return the redirect and nil for the error. Our store method is much shorter because all we have to do is just take our redirect and convert it into a map and then store that into our Redis database. So we go ahead and generate our key using our redirect code. Then we can create our data map. And this is just a map of string and interface. So we just have code, redirect code, URL, redirect URL, and then created at, redirect, created at. 
and then we can just call our client HM set with the key in the data to set this in the database and then call result to get back the result. And if we get back an error, we want to handle it. Otherwise, we want to return nil. Alrighty, so we finished our ports for both the repository and the serializer. And if we wanted to, we could implement some kind of command line tool, which would allow us to pass in a URL and then get back a code that represents that URL. The important things I want you guys to take away with this code are the fact that the code itself also only handles its own concerns. So our Redis repository is only concerned with being able to create a Redis client and then use that Redis client to put redirects into the database. And the same also goes for our MongoDB client. Another thing I want you guys to notice is how the dependencies work in our application. We have our app and domain logic, which is not dependent upon any of our other modules. Then we have our ports and adapters, which are directly dependent upon the app and domain logic, but they're not dependent upon each other. This is important because it keeps the encapsulation and the separation of concerns between each of the modules. All right, guys, well, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, feel free to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the box below. And if you dislike this video, then by all means, downvote it as much as you like. If you want to catch the next video in this series, then go ahead and push that notification bell. Have a good night.